Good morning. Do you have your Tabasco with you? I do. Precious gift. They tell me it comes out of a military. What do you call those meals? Yeah, MRE. But it's going to have a very special place some of the time in my pocket to remind me that I'm supposed to be a person of Tabasco. And some of the time it'll sit beside my desk where I can look and say, hmm, Robert, are you being Tabasco today? Good thing. Those of you who don't know what we're talking about, I preached a sermon about six or eight weeks ago on Tabasco, so I might ought to tell you all that. Be going to Ukraine here in a few weeks, and uh, the thought occurred to me, even though we have just not too many months ago, weeks ago, um, asked for those who'd like to help with the diabetes fund to maybe give us uh, some funds uh, for that, and, and you were very, very generous. Those have been communicated to uh, Don Etzt and have been being used and are getting uh, relatively uh, close to being used up. But uh, we also have uh, an opportunity to send more, and uh, one of the benefits of sending more is that we don't have any bank fees, uh, and that uh, makes the money go just a little further. So if some of y'all are interested in participating, I'll need to have it by next Sunday. I know that's a little bit short notice, but that's the way things are. When I look at you and I say something about this world, what do you think? I know some people are just constantly optimistic. But I look at this world and I grieve. I look at this world and I see what this world really ought to be, and I see instead of us making progress, us deteriorating. And I talk to people about the message of Jesus, and I find it so incredible. Once upon a time when I began to talk with people, they knew a little bit about the Bible. They knew a little bit about Jesus. They knew a little bit about spiritual things. But now, quite frequently, I'll start talking to someone and I'll discover, hey, you've got to go back to Genesis 1. Because we have just allowed the gospel to to become a silent voice in this world. And we're not really making that big of a difference, maybe. Maybe. Now, I know that most of us are trying to be the sort of folks that are trying to make a difference, but the reality is that the culture around us is really, really handicapping us. And I don't know if we really have the power or the ability in and of ourselves to make a significant difference, but I do know that if we are in Christ Jesus and if we're allowing the power of God to work within us, Indeed, we can make a significant difference in this world. Paul believed it with all of his heart. He was not ashamed of the gospel, for it was God's power. It was God's ability. It was the message and the method which God chose to make a difference in the lives of this world. I had a conversation probably about uh, three or four weeks ago, don't remember exactly when, with a young lady. She happened to be serving me and somehow asked what my occupation was, and I told her that I was a minister, that I, I preached the good news of Jesus, and that kind of led to one of those scenarios. She says, well, I'm sure you think that's good, but truth is, I don't think the Bible is relevant anymore. Not sure that the Bible really speaks to us and our dilemmas and our problems and our difficulties. Well, I didn't pick an argument and I didn't 
discourage the conversation, but I knew that that was the way the world thinks today. I've been reading some Charles Dickens. I've read Oliver Twist. I've read, reread Tale of Two Cities. I'm two-thirds of the way through David Copperfield. And as I continually read, and it irritates Sue very much because I get so intense in that book that I kind of ignore everything that's going on. But I get so intense in that book because what I see is that life really hasn't changed much. The issues and the problems that are there are the issues and problems that God was dealing with here. And the difficulties that they were having in their human relationships there and the cruelties that were there were the same sort of human relationships and cruelties that God was dealing with here. And you may put it in a little bit different context and you may dress it up in an automobile instead of a horse and carriage. But the same scenarios are playing out in these books that are several hundred years old, close to 300 years old maybe, what was here 2,000 years ago, and what's here today. And it makes me stop and think, well, what can we do about this? What difference can we possibly make? This last week I revisited a little story about the harvest mouse in England. The harvest mouse is a curious little creature that when the farmer goes out and tills the soil and plants the corn, the harvest mouse then looks at that as his home. And, and so the, the cornfield becomes where he lives. And uh, the cornfield seems like a perfect place to live. After all, the, the corn stalks become as trees of protection to the harvest mouth, and so they mate there, and, and they play there, and they raise their families there, and everything seems so very, very good, and, and, and they just kind of rock along for a little while until the harvest comes. And then when the harvest comes, all of a sudden, the harvesters wreak havoc with the world in which the little field mouse lives. The thing that comes to my mind is our world is not much different from the pre-harvest field of the field mouse. I look at us and sometimes even us within the body of Christ and I, I look at us and I see us just kind of meandering along in this world, being, being adapted to too much of this world, to allowing culture to influence us so much that sometimes we don't really stop and contemplate what's going on in reality. And that we really need to open up our hearts and open up our minds to something that's different. Something that can ultimately make the difference because at some point in time comes the harvest. Oh, I know the problem with most of us is we get up every morning and the sun has gotten up just as we get up. And every night the sun goes down and life continues and we don't see a whole lot of change. We just get older But the truth is, there's a time in which the harvest is going to come, and mankind is going to have to pay the piper. We're going to have to, to get to the point where we realize that there are some issues that we need to be dealing with, and the world begins to see that there are issues that they need to be dealing with, and they are the issues that God has shared with us in His divine book. And He gives us the solution. He gives us the abilities to overcome. That gets us to our text. Here's the Apostle Paul. I love the Apostle Paul because of his prolific writings, the Holy Spirit giving him utterance. As he looks at all of these various congregations, the relationship that Paul has with Rome is, is slightly different than maybe what he had at Colossae because he started Colossae, he didn't start Rome. More than likely, the church at Rome was started by the Jews of the dispersion who, who were scattered, and they went all the way to Rome, and then they began to teach Christianity, and they converted a few Gentiles. For a while, they were very happy there. Then the emperor said, you've got to leave, and sent all the Jews out of Rome. But the Jewish Christian, the church, was still there. 
And Paul had a tremendous desire, as he expresses in Acts, to, to go and to preach the gospel in Rome. He wanted to be a part of those people who were at Rome. And so Colton read for us a few moments ago this beautiful passage in which Paul talks about the fact that he has great desire because of the gospel of Christ to come up to Rome because he wanted to bring about the obedience of the faith among the Gentiles for the sake of Christ's name. What you and I need to realize about this world and whether or not we, we live in this world as the harvest mouse or we live in this world as the victorious people is that we have got to be responsive to Christ. We've got to be responsive to the teachings of Christ. We've got to allow His message to penetrate our hearts and penetrate our minds to the point that we say, I want to be obedient to Him. The Hebrew writer talks about Jesus, though he was perfect, learned obedience through the things which he suffered. And in verse 9, chapter 5, it says, he became the author of salvation to all those who obey him, who are responsive to him. And it's quite interesting to me that if you can ever get an individual who is lost deeply in sin, who has <coughs> a tremendous difficult past, to begin to see the new light the new way, the new hope, which is in Christ Jesus, it makes all of the difference. That's what Paul is going to go ahead and say to us here in this passage. He's going to say, I long to see you. Why do I want to see you people in Rome? Why, why am I wanting to be a part of you that I can impart some spiritual gift? He's not talking about divine healing. He's talking about spiritual grace. He's not talking about that which is beyond the laws of nature that God gave to some. Here he's talking about the message that makes the difference. The message of Jesus Christ that when it becomes the message that you have, it begins to make you into a different person. This morning we had the television on to dress by. And there was this news article about people going into superstores and stealing Tide. I, 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 I looked at Sue and I said, I don't understand. Why are they stealing bottles and bottles of Tide, the big jugs? And she said, well, the problem is you don't think like a criminal. <laughs> well, thank goodness for that. I don't understand. What are you going to do? Well, what they do is they go and they take those $20 bottles of Tide that you buy at Walmart for $17.97, and they put them out in small little decanters, and they sell them for two or three bucks a piece at the laundry mats, et cetera, and so forth, and they turn a $20 profit, well, a zero cost to them because they've stolen it, into $60. I didn't understand that. I wouldn't have ever thought about that. You know? Why? Because someone imparted a spiritual grace to me, a gift years ago. And because as I began to think about Jesus and, and begin to let Jesus and his message penetrate my life, I, I lost sight of how to be a dark person. That's what happens to you. That's what happens to people in the world that we take the gospel to. It's what makes a big difference. So Paul says, I want to come to Rome. What I want so that I can impart some spiritual gift that you may be established. Boy, that's a problematic situation when we convert folks. Getting them to stick. That's also a problematic situation with you and I getting us to grow up in our relationship with Christ Jesus. The Colossian writer, Paul says to, to the church of Colossae, chapter 2, verse 6, he says that you would walk in Him. It, you don't just become a Christian so that your sins are remitted and all of a sudden you live your life any way you want to. That's what the world keeps telling us. That's what we keep buying into. But no, that's not it. I want you to be established, as Paul says in Colossians 2, verse 7. I want you to be built up in the faith. I want you to have a firm foundation. I want you to grow. I want to see some difference in your life. That's a big challenge. 
Because sometimes people become Christians and they don't have any background and then we forget that we need to baby them and raise them and encourage them and grow them up so that, as Paul says, they can be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you. I seriously doubt that any of us last very long in whatever we're trying to do in life without some encouragement somewhere. We may be in a miserable job. We may be having demands placed upon us that are just beyond belief. And then there's someone who comes in and says to you, I know that your work is so tedious. I know that, that, that there's unreal pressures, but you know, if you'll keep your eye upon your task and make a difference in your job, the reward will be there. And oh, by the way, I think you're doing a good job. That make a difference? Oh, man. You think Paul ever got discouraged with his ministry? I know he did. I know he did. Several places he kind of expresses that he was concerned about what was going on. But then there would be someone who would say to him, Brother Paul, thank you. Thank you so much for being light in my life and making a difference in my life. And you and I as individuals in Christ need to hear that from one another every now and then as Paul wanted to hear it from the church at Rome. He wanted to be encouraged together with them. And do you think it was easy to be a Christian living under the, the, the emperor's thumb? I don't think so. Do you realize how careful they had to be to, to be faithful to God on the one hand and, and, and to ward off the, the difficulties that were around them, the culture that pressed against them so greatly? I imagine it was a pretty good task. But Paul says, I want to be encouraged together with you while I'm among you. So the question comes to my mind, well, how do we illuminate the world to the saving grace of Jesus? How do we do it? Paul, in this passage, gives us a formula. It is a universal formula. It is a formula that every single person in this audience and everyone who's listening on the Internet and wherever it might be that these sermons go, can do. Because it's so simple, it's so basic. And yet, we ignore it. And because we ignore it, maybe we are not making the difference. We are not the Tabasco that we ought to be to the people that we come in contact with in the world in which we live. Paul, what's your formula? How do we illuminate this world with the saving grace of Jesus? We go out and buy big billboards? Is that the way you do it, Paul? No. Well, we'd buy some television time. That might be good. It may do something good. But no. It's every Christian assuming a posture in life that has three distinctive qualities in it. I am under obligation, Paul writes, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith unto faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. May we be blessed by the reading of God's holy word. Paul, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about I'm under obligation. I've got a debt. I've got a debt. As Paul understood where he was 
And then he understood where Christ brought him to. He saw that there was a tremendous debt that was accumulated in the process. Why do you live for Jesus, Paul? Well, in Timothy, he says, I was the chief of sinners, chapter 1. I was the chief of sinners. I was the one who, who stood there when Stephen was being sold, that righteous man of God who, who spoke nothing but the truth. <clears throat> I consented to his death. I was the one who got the letters, and I was headed on my way to Damascus to try to make, make havoc in those Christians in Damascus because they were thwarting what I knew. But then I came to my knees, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. I came to my knees and literally was bowed before the Father. And I came to understand that the message of Christ was the message that was going to change things and make a difference. I can't think of any argument that we're making in our political structure today that the answer is not Christianity and Christ's principles. I can't think of any social dilemma or social problem that we're facing today that would not be changed and could not be changed if we were to allow Christ to penetrate us. And when we come to realize that, we realize that we're under a debt. We have an obligation. Listen, as Paul wrote to the church of Colossae, chapter 2, verse 13, but when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Forgiveness. <laughs> the answer to about 95% of all ills in life is in forgiveness. I've read some remarkable stories in the last few years, I'm sure that you have, of people who had had vengeance upon them greatly, and they finally came to the conclusion the only way they could deal with that was by extending forgiveness. I'm here to tell you, my friend, the only way that you can find true healing in life is through the forgiveness which is in Christ Jesus, and that forgiveness puts you under an obligation to Him. So when your next door neighbor comes up to you and talks about the struggle that's going on in his life, do you feel a debt? A debt so greatly that you'll say to him, have you ever contemplated becoming amenable to Christ? Have you ever thought about looking into his words in which he is the way, the truth, and the life gives you hope and power? I'm under obligation. Paul was for Agrippa, and you begin to see how strongly he felt his obligation. Acts chapter 26, verse 18, I am here to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in Christ Jesus. That's what makes the difference. But it's not going to get out there. If we don't feel an obligation, then Paul says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Are you eager with the message? Got an email from a friend the other day, said, I can just hardly wait until such and such a movie comes out. I wrote him back and I said, why? And he gave me about six paragraphs of why he was so excited about that movie. And because he is a dear friend and knows that I love him dearly, I wrote back, are you as eager about your preaching He wrote back, thanks. 
put a little perspective on it. Oh, the Super Bowl is coming up. Well, we just get so excited about the Super Bowl. I can just hardly wait for it to get here. Man, I can hardly wait till the Pro Bowls. Is that on today? I don't really know. <laughs> I just thought it was. We get eager. During about the 1st of December, my granddaughter kept coming up to me and says, Papa, Christmas is coming. Man, she was eager about that. Are we eager? But here's a person whose life may be going so very well as far as prosperity and everything is concerned, but they are in the shambles because of sin and degradation. Are we eager to tell them, you know, you can have a life of meaning and significance if you would turn yourself over to Christ? And if you would allow the gospel message to allow you to become obedient to the faith, and if you would, in obedience to the faith, start becoming what Jesus has asked us all to become? Paul was dying to go to Rome. And God gave him the ticket to go to Rome because he was eager to preach the gospel to these fine folks. For Paul says to the church at Corinth, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And Paul had those burning coals within his heart and within his mind that he would declare to the church at Corinth again later on, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel of Christ. I'm eager. But then thirdly in this formula, Paul says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Reading a passage in David Copperfield, there's this little midget that comes around. She performs all sorts of services for people that, and does so in a humorous way to make her living. But she gets really, really serious with David Copperfield on the night that little Emily runs off with Steerforth. And um, she talks about how people toyed with her and how there were people who really would not even acknowledge her because she was in that dwarfed body. And I thought, oh, how that is when it comes to the gospel. Because you see, Jesus doesn't look normal to the world. God and his message doesn't look normal to all of us. It's, it's a little different. Copperfield looks at her, she gets ready to go, and he says, I like you. I like you well. You'll be my friend. I'll always acknowledge you in some words similar to that. And I thought, man, if we could just develop that heart and attitude about the gospel of Jesus, to not take that light and put it under the bushel but on the lampstand, so that it can give light to everyone that we come in contact with. If, if we would develop the heart that Paul had that says, I'm not ashamed of Jesus, I'm not ashamed of his message. I can tell you there's been many times in my life when I've struggled with this very issue. When you're in a group of people and you know that when you say something about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, it's not going to be a popular message. It's not going to stand you up well. But when you quietly and humbly say to them, have you ever thought about the difference that the gospel of Jesus could make in your life, the good news that changes people from being harvest mice into redeemed men? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why, Paul? It's the power of God. It's the power of God 
Paul says that in God's infinite wisdom, he chose this very simple message, the message which he preached to make a difference in this world, to cause this world to be changed into the likeness of himself. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. It's for salvation to everyone who believes, regardless of who you are. In the context of the New Testament, he talks about those who are Jews, and then he also talks about those who are Greeks. But it's kind of like the little song that we sing about all the little children that God loves, all the different colors. They're all God's concern. And salvation comes to all men. And even the most vilest of sinners can find redemption. But we've got to be willing to share the message. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. That's the changed life. A life that lives in harmony with what God wants. That's what makes the difference. One final verse as we close from 1 Peter chapter 1. It's one of those verses of great hope and encouragement when someone is willing to let the gospel work in their life. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Peter writes, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What for, Peter? Why? To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Words of life. Words of life. Can we take the world from where it is to where it ought to be? Yes, we can, but we're going to have to do it by preaching, teaching, and sharing lovingly and compassionately the message of Christ. For I'm under obligation, Paul says, I'm eager to preach that message to you in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation, Jew first and also to the Greek.